Haymaker Coffee Company was established in 2021 to create the best coffee to fuel the underdogs who perseveres, who hustles, and have the give-it-all mentality to achieve their American dream. Haymaker Coffee only roasts top quality, specialty-grade coffee beans resulting in brews that satisfies those who demand every drop from their coffee and day. If you work hard, run hard, fight hard, and play hard, we have your coffee right here. And we're back. Another edition Stripe Show podcast. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. Hope you're having a great week. And uh, this is going to be a special one, folks, because the guy joining me here uh, is coming to me from uh, the Sunshine Coast in Australia. It's actually Thursday morning there, Wednesday evening where I'm at in Ponte Vedra. So, Grant, good morning to you. Grant Field, the uh, coach, longtime coach to Cameron Smith. This is going to be a lot of fun here to to get some insight because you know Cameron perhaps better than anybody. So the Iron Game, let's talk about some of the, I, I, I was reading some of the stuff that you were talking about and things that you were doing um, with, uh, with them. And one of them was you were talking about kind of this, this hand path and the lead arm yep. relationship yep. to the body. And you can see it with Cameron where he He'll, it's almost a little bit like DJ where his hands will maybe kind of want to climb away from a little bit. Yeah. So you guys try to keep it more in. And then you were also talking about this orientation, like the, the right side, maybe a little higher than the left. Talk, take us through that a little bit. Yeah. So basically, um, like you said, I mean, one of his tendencies is for his arms to sort of get a little bit out and away from his body. And then he drops it a little bit more in so that the arms sort of over travel and drop under. And then he sort of has to, you know, side bend and then try and catch up. So, you know, the bad ones would be, you know, to the right and then, you know, the overdraw. So for Cam, when he does a better job of that first movement, loading properly and getting the arms and the body a little bit more connected. And, you know, look, if you're looking at parallel to the ground, you'll see that the hand, uh, the, the club heads sort of cover the hands from a down the line point of view. Mm-hmm. You know, that's when he's in the right position. So he gets the right depth early enough rather than getting out and not getting deep enough and then sort of losing it in behind him and then having to get out of the road. So, and I think, um, again, like I said, with the improvements to his uh, physical ability, he's just done a bad job. Like that's stuff that we've always worked on. Like it hasn't really changed. It's just, you know, he's able to do a better job. And, and you know, he's, he's with the off season, just focused more on it, mm-hmm. you know, Obviously, when you're during the season, like we're talking about it, but really, you know, the time to actually work on it is hard. Um, but, you, you know, as I said, that's uh, – it's always been, you know, for a better term, our, our way of doing things. Like, I, you know, we've been really big on having a blueprint all along, you know, mm-hmm. and we sort of vary – because we know it works, right? We've yeah. got to know, know what works and what right. doesn't. Um, so the more – you know, like I always sort of think like, you know, if, if we're in a bowling alley and we put the bumpers on, on, on these bumpers to try and keep him, you know, on his, in his alley, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, the more that we can stay on course, you know, we know that we've got something that's pretty effective. When his when his hands and arm kind of, when they kind of go away, right? Or yep. like out here too much. Yep. And then he, and then he turns, does, does that tend to, to kind of lead him into that maybe flatter type of turn yeah, or is that a separate deal? Okay. No. Absolutely, especially with the longer clubs. Yeah, you know he's he's always pretty good with the short stuff. Um, mm-hmm. he doesn't get that. I think. Yeah, you know, obviously, the more that he's trying to create power, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, the more he he wanted to get more of that. And then, like you said, it turn a little level, and then you know to create a steep, he'd go this way to get you know back and under it. So, um, you know, he kind of had to do that. That wasn't a you know a given. Like if he wanted to hit the ball, that's what he had to do. So, yeah. Um, you know, now that he can sort of you know maintain that first move, like you said, stay in his tilts a little bit better. Yeah, you know, he can stay more on top of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, he uses the ground better to push up and and go around. So, yes, yeah, that's good stuff. That's all connected here because we talk about this. And the one thing that just drives me nuts, Grant, is when I see, well, all that matters is impact. You know, the back swings. Eh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. Well. It's funny when I get the best coaches in the world and we have a conversation, oftentimes we're talking about the backswing. <laughs> yeah. you know? so very rarely, um, in my opinion, are we actually, you know, for me, impacts a moment in time, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're moving properly, impacts a byproduct of the stuff that's come before it. Yeah. You know, right. and, and good players can make stuff work. And that's one of the issues sometimes is good players, you know, they're just good. Yeah. You know, so make things work. And, you know, I sort of work on that, you know, from start to impacts. You know, barely a second. 
you know, and if you're not in the right positions to, to deliver that, you know, it's mm -hmm. very, very difficult to, uh, yep. to get back to a good and, and repeatable impact position. So. And Cam's such a good example of like the face. The face looks up a little towards the sky, maybe slightly closed. I'm, I'm barking on amateurs all the time about the importance of face angle. And I had a guy just today on the lesson team. We were talking about face angle. And he, we were talking about, I said, you know, I can probably count on one hand how many have the face open at the top. Yeah. You know, like, like it's just, there's just not many. And there's some. Yeah, there's not many. Come. Yeah. If, and, and it's like, and, and the name that always comes to mind is Hudson Swafford, right? It's like that dude gets it open. And then he just, you know, he just swivels it down, leans the yep. shaft forward. And, and so that was brought up. Well, Hudson Swafford kind of, you know, Georgia guy here in Florida, they just won the net. Hudson I'm like, look, you want to get the face open and you want to make that move coming down and you want to do that, you know, and try to develop some shaft lean in the process of doing that, knock yourself out. Like Eight that's just tough. Over a second or something, you know, like <laughs> not easy. Yeah. The backswing matters. I mean, it, it does. And, and like, I always use it. I always use the idea of like we're trying to improve the probability of impact here. We're trying to keep these bumpers where you can just be instinctive and hit it. And the backswing's like a huge part of that. And here's Cam Smith, number ten player in the world, talking with his longtime coach. And it's like, yeah, we're just trying to get his left arm to be a little more here. We're mm -hmm. trying to keep him on his orientation. And then from there, it's like, yeah, he can do all the rest of it a lot easier. Go ahead and hit, go ahead and hit it. Yeah, you know, and and even before that, you know, I I think how we start, you know, just from a uh, you know a body position and and a joint position, you know, okay. in front, obviously how we move to start. So again, you know, where I position my body is going to influence. Like when we look at grips and things like that, you know, I mean, how I set my body with angles, with you know, internally, or externally, rotate, you know, that all those things are going to influence that, which then mm -hmm. influences how the club moves away. You know, so they're all parts of the the puzzle. You know, so so often I'm going back to you know where it starts and how yeah. it moves to start. And generally speaking, you know, those things are going to set somebody up to move properly on the way through. And uh, one of the top teachers in the game joins me from LA. He's heading to Riviera. Dana Dahlquist. Let me let me bring up Bo's swing here. You were talking about the early move here mm -hmm. with the club face and and him kind of opening it. And and now so him, is that toe a little bit more down in is mm -hmm. his lead wrist. This is something I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Is his and I cuz I was going back to some of his college days and whatnot, but is his lead wrist the condition there the same or is that something that's changed a little bit through that first move of keeping the face more let's say closed? Yeah, that changed a lot. He used to when he was younger, he kind of had um kind of the club outside the hands and then worked up a little bit. And the one thing I guess would say be a differential from what he did as a, as a younger player is he used to have a lot of like left leg kind of sagged and um, he would, uh, he would rotate, but then his right arm would get severely behind him. Um, and the issue he had when he did that is he could only hit draws. He couldn't hit cuts as much. Um, and to be fair to play on the PGA tour, it's kind of nice once in a while if you got a back right pin position you want to hit off speed iron to kind of hit it middle of the green and let it fall to the right or you know take some of that on and when your elbows back behind you and your face gets a little open it's pretty it's pretty hairy <laughs> <laughs> well so did you, you saw that video i posted in on my instagram right of him to he's describing that if you haven't you need to get you guys need to go look at that on my instagram at travis Holton golf and Go check out Dana's at, at Dana Dahlquist because he posts a ton of great stuff. And there is a cool video of Bo talking yeah. about that right elbow position. Yeah. Yeah. That that's that's improving over time. It's gotten wider. It's it's more, I guess you'd say, pitch looking. Um because yeah, when we started, I mean, it was coming through his right shoulder and open and the club was out. And you know, the only thing you got from there is the tilt back and mm throw the face at it so yeah it, i'm pretty happy where it is right now and i hopefully he is so yeah is he a perfectionist is he someone who like do you have to i don't know bo i've never met bo um i've, I've obviously has followed his career and the whole bit but is he is there times with him where you have to pull him back and say hey let's not be so technical or is he good at managing the changes and being able to compartmentalize and like, look, I, I got it. Now let's go play and be an instinctive. Yeah. I think he's really good at that. Okay. Um, when the bell rings, 
it's it's interesting. It's actually one of the first times with a tour pro that I've not had to like kind of go, oh, this is going to be interesting. Mm. Um, he's very he is he is a perfectionist, and most of them are, and uh, at least the ones that I've worked with. Um, yeah. I'm not saying that I generally get the guys that, that need a lot of work, but um, they, this is like one of those rare instances where, you know, he knows how to draw that line in the sand. So, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Um, when it's game time, he's like, and, and what's interesting, and I think the viewers would like this, mm -hmm. he won't hit a shot that he's not capable of. So he might be working on something for three weeks. And if it's not there, he won't put it into play. And which is really cool to watch because it doesn't fit that first narrative that we talked about, about C shot, hit shot. You know, I think um, if, if he feels like he's hitting an overdraw, he's just going to go play it because the end of the day, you got to, you know, po post, a, post a number. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty refreshing to, to see a person who's like that. One thing I always like about Bo swing is that if you look at where, um, I'll start it here from the beginning here. Like you've got his hands there at a dress and he returns his hands. When you look at this down at the bottom, I would say almost to the same spot, right? I mean, maybe just a touch higher as far as there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of raising of the shaft yeah. Yeah. at impact relative to where it was at a dress. And when you look at that position there, you can see the hand path exiting comfortably to the left, the club head, just a little bit out in front of the hands, you can still see. And then when it exits, it, it's, it's under that left shoulder and the yeah. face is kind of, I'll throw a word at you, a little layback How about yeah. that, right? From the old golfing machine days, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little layback in the face looking back. And that's something you see with a lot of players, right? You see this, handle you know kind of in close mm -hmm. exiting left shafts under the shoulder here with this iron face yeah. got a little lay back is that something that has kind of come into the fold here as the pivots improved as the face is improved etc cetera, et cetera? yeah yeah the pivot and particularly like him now getting into his left side and pushing off the left foot allows him to go from that lead wrist flex position into something that hits and goes into kind of that extended layback look mm -hmm. and um you know in the past that wasn't really happening there was more like mm -hmm. rotation of the face so uh because of the opening going back yeah 100 yeah. percent. yeah 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 we see that with a lot of the, the modern players now when you look at colin marikawa and yeah. you know john rom and the list goes on. I mean, it, it, it's becoming something that's pretty prevalent on the tour. If you're saying whether it's a trend or it's a necessity, I mean, that it's a, that'd be an interesting conversation, but yeah, uh, a lot more guys are going into a position that's more, you know, risk flexion. Justin Parsons, who's up in sea Island, one of the top coaches in the game. And we had a little X's and O's folks. And look at this, this golf swing, perhaps you've seen it. Perhaps you like it. His name is Louis Ustazen. I'll just keep it. I'll just keep an open canvas here. When you watch this, what what can you share with us that is so magical to all everyone when they watch this this player swim? I mean, his rhythm's been so good. His balance, the whole it's like Ernie L's, but smaller frame. Um, but like, just just talk to us about Louis Ustazen and how this uh, swing works. On a beautiful heavy, a beautiful heavy hit on the golf ball. You know, hmm. I, I think. You know, men, so, some people that are listening might have had interest and in, like listen to what Louis and I have done. I think giving some people into a little bit of a different insight. You know, when 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 you play golf with Louis, or you you know you, you maybe you know I play golf with him, and he I would say, well, what do you think of my stuff? He'll always go back to his drills. You know, and he you know it's funny that he has his own set of little things that he does. He hits golf balls with his feet together. He's very very aware from like from face on of his balance. He makes sure that the line from his forehead through his nose, down through his chest, through his pelvis, through his ankles, everything's very, very balanced. And he hits balls with his feet together and he works on his strike a little bit. 
And he does that really just to kind of find things. And then he'll take a little bit of a, a, a gentle step away with his feet and he'll have a slightly wider stance and then he'll move it. So his awareness of balance and his awareness of posture are, you know, incredibly almost unique to me. And if you um, if you take him back down to his, his starting posture, a lot of the time when we're, you know, when we're working, I'm acting as a policeman and he's sort of saying to me, listen, am I standing the correct distance from the ball? Am I well balanced? And if you bring him into his, his setup, you know, a lot of people and John Ram is like this, a lot of great ball strikers like this. He really gets close, so close to the golf ball that if, if most amateurs stood there, they'd be pretty uncomfortable. Now, Louis is unusual because he's got slightly longer arms and mm -hmm. shorter spine, longer legs. But, you know, he gets into the golf ball, creating room with his pelvis behind him right through the centers or even through the, 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 the heels uh, towards the heels of the centers of his feet. We see that with John Ram. We see that with Sergio Garcia. We see that obviously with Louis Oosthuizen. You see that with Paul Casey. A lot of really, really good ball strikers get into their posterior chain and have a starting position where they have to create space. And Louis is a starting position where he has to create space. And you know, we work a lot on on his on his setup. He's acutely aware of his alignment. Uh, he's acutely aware of the fact that you know, again, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, sometimes it, there's things that will make him aim a little to the right. Uh, you know, we look at that an awful lot, you know, and then from there, it's, you know, he knows he'll talk about when his golf swing feels too fast or feels too slow. And oftentimes when it feels too fast, it's because his right side hasn't loaded up correctly. Mm. Um, so he does a lot of work in making sure that he can load the right side of his pelvis towards the top of his backswing, you know, getting that, nice strong depth um at the top of his swing and then when that's done i think that you know he's really just fluid um i'm still you know he creates a surprising amount of power yeah very very heavy hit on the golf ball you know from face on you can see here uh, something that i'm studying a little bit you know as you wind him up to the top of your backswing um especially with that little elbow brace on there you'll you'll detect some sneaky little arm bend in his golf swing Mm. Um, his his lead arm bends a little bit um, as he as he gets towards the very very top of the backswing, and and definitely then re straightens or reflexes through the impact area, and there is no doubt that that's a that's a speed generator something that you know we used to talk about J B Holmes doing an awful lot, um, but for the amount of effort that Louis seems to put into it, goodness me he gets a lot of bang for his buck, um, yeah. and then it's, it's it's a joy to watch him to watch him hit shots and he had a great year last year i'm looking forward to oh. you know to see to seeing him in phoenix and getting going again and uh you know it's it's a golf swing that i feel my responsibility is to help you know help him with his feels uh be responsible to you know knowing that it's a thing of great beauty and balance that you're working with and and uh trying to ensure that you're you know you're you're thoughtful in your approach and not over you know overdoing it because you know you give a pseudo genius like louis the capacity to figure it out on his own and, and nine times out of ten he'll do that yeah four runner-ups that included the pga and the u.s open two-thirds which included the open championship and he was also 26 at the Masters. so if you're into like you know top threes in the big game, major big championship game big big game hunter <laughs> yeah you know, I, there's so much here when I watch Louie. The first move, I think, is just so cash. The, when you watch the shaft and the lead arm, like, it just, this straight line relationship, just, like, that move right there, boom. Just everything together. Yeah. You know, there's no real change in the lead wrist dynamic. And just getting that to start like that, and now that left shoulder's traveling across early, and, you know, it just gets everything just started correctly. Like when I think of Louie, yes, it's smooth, but it started correctly. And it was fascinating to hear you say when he gets into the right hip and loaded and not quick is it's like, okay, now go right. It's, and, and you can yeah. kind of see that with Louie, like it's just all so together and loaded into the right side and now coming down. And the other thing with Louie, and I want to point this out is when I, Pull up this other view. Here we go. And this isn't a perfect camera angle, but we'll we'll get the idea here. He, you know, he's a player that rotates the face a little bit, Justin. You know, like he, mm -hmm. you know, he rotates that toe right there, you know, a bit toe up. It's, you'll certainly see more players. And again, the camera angle is not ideal, but I get it. But the toe is rotated a little more up. Mm -hmm. We'll certainly see players like Victor and 
Rom, where the toe is more down. But Louis always played like this. In fact, you'll see a lot of players from this era. Ernie Yells played like this, where the face was a bit more rotated toe up. You could maybe see less of the face at the top, you know, and then coming down, you know, he just very cleverly gets the face to rotate back down and square up and then release back up the other side. But I would say, would you agree that there is more face rotation with Louis, say, compared to some other players who tend to get the face a little more hooded, a little more shut, where you can see more of the face at the top? There's no doubt. I mean, I, I you know, this is this is a really interesting topic, Travis, and you know, forgive me if I go too deeply into it. No, please. The the the, the face obviously is going to have be impacted by the way the player holds the club and the mm-hmm. way the shoulders the shoulders and the, the spine are able to load the club to the top of the backswing or the the muscles surrounding the spine, if you like. So when you get a very very traditional grip like Louis, where he has you know a, a neutral to strong left hand grip and a neutral to weak right hand grip, and he creates pressure on his left hand, which would go to the right and the right hand go to the left. In essence, a little bit like a butterfly grip. If you could imagine the, the butterfly grip, you would know in a bunker. That tends to put his shoulders into a position where the, the front parts of his shoulders will lo- load the golf club and we'll see a lot of toe up. We see that in Rory's golf swing, like you oh. said, Ernie's golf swing. When you look at the tendencies for the uh, players who use the, uh, the lower part of the shoulders, the lats, the serratus, the triceps to load the club, they tend to have a slightly weaker grip or a lot more handle lean or both in order to be able to generate that appearance where the golf club will be, to your point, a lot more closed to the path, but they're mm-hmm. also loading it with a different with a different muscle structure, if you like. So mm-hmm. Louis has got a much more classic, um, we would refer to as classic kind of muscle structure and the way he grips the club. I think that's changing. I think to your point, I think um, we would probably, we're going to probably see more Victor Hovlands in the next 20 years than we are um, Louis Oosthuizen's. I think the way that we're teaching the grip will probably change just a little bit uh, to accommodate uh, some of those movements. As we see people like, you know, Morikawa become more dominant, Victor becoming more dominant, the things that Bryson's doing to make the body you know, far uh, far more effectively. And the, the only part of the game that it, it, it can be a little more troublesome with as we can see is the short game because you don't get uh, right. the same early early opening in the golf in the golf swing and they don't tend to bryson victor perhaps perhaps be as good pitching the ball and you know hitting maybe chip shots around the greens as, as some of those others would be and that's something that you've got to obviously balance if you're thinking about this yourself yeah that's well said i mean I, I couldn't agree with that anymore you know what you just said there with Louis and Victor and the way you see these patterns and, um, you know, and it's just the, the genius of Louis, right? This is a way he has swung the golf club the whole time and to get in there and maybe weaken that grip and flex the lead wrist more. I mean, you're playing with fire at that point. You know, you would never do that to a player like this. Who's generated his swing around, obviously rotating the face the way that it is and a little more extension in the lead wrist. You can certainly see it right here you know, and keeping that in line and then loading to the top. But look, he comes down, got the shaft lean, got an up rotation, lets it release back up the other side. Obviously, um, his feels and his rhythm and the way he puts it together, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's it's eye candy, right? I mean, you just, you just sit there and you watch it and you're like, Damn! Like, how does that dude ever miss a shot? You know, I mean, it's. <laughs> I, and, I, and I think, I think to your point, I think we're, you know, obviously, even with the young players I teach now, there's so much information, and I quite often encourage them not necessarily to get rid of all the information because I don't think they're going to do that, but to be able to filter out the bits that are going to help you. So you know, if you're watching Louis, you know, look at his posture, look at the way he creates a posture that makes him create room in the golf swing. Look at his rhythm. Look at his balance, the timing of the movement. I mean, I think it, I don't think that matters so much whether he's got lead rest arrangements like DJ or or whoever else. I think you can you can learn great things from great players, and I think with Louis, you're learning about rhythm, balance, um, putting yourself in a position over the ball where you can organize things well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know those those are things that 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 all players, regardless of the way you want a grip, left wrist closed open face 
uh, that you can learn from. Glenfiddich, the world's most awarded single malt scotch whiskey, is expertly crafted and made with extraordinary care. Each single malt is a work of perfection. For him, coming just outside of New Orleans, uh, the director of instruction for Augusta Country Club joins us here today, Gary Crescent. As you as you watch this swing here, you know, kind of share with my audience some of the things you work on here with uh, with Henrik. Yeah, so Henrik and I have been working together for uh, just about five years, I, I think. But um, you know, he did get off there in the beginning of the year. He made a couple of cuts early, but wasn't hitting it very well, and then started to try to get into getting that better. And um, starting now to where we, he he got into some we got into some trouble where there was a couple of shoulder alignments that we didn't like and then which caused some face control issues. And then he wasn't really getting loaded very well uh, as a result of trying to get more face control. So um, with the, with the help of Josh and his uh, Josh Gregory, who's a short, short game instructor. And, and also, you know, we all work together on all of it. So we're a team um, and Frederick his his coach from home uh, when he grew up in Sweden, the, uh, the three of us kind of worked together to get um, him back into a little better setup, get him loaded a little better where he could fire through it a little bit uh, cleaner and get his body to rotate through golf shots. So we've been working more of an overall kind of thing here, nothing real super positional. Uh, one of the big things that we tend to work on uh, from face on is to make sure that the the left leg, left knee doesn't get inside of the left hip because when he does that, uh, in the backswing, when he gets the left knee inside of the left hip, uh, he tends to start running with his hips and then he's, uh, tilting on it instead of turning through it, uh, at the bottom. So that was one of the first things that we really worked on. And, uh, he had real quick success with that. He, that was when he had just, um, when he almost won at RSM, I think that was 17, 16 or 17. I think it was 17. And there was a five man mm -hmm. playoff at RSM, but, um, Anyway, so since then, we've been working on, if you go down the line, uh, Henrik is, is a little more vertical of a swinger mm -hmm. um, and been working to try to get a little more depth with the amount of width that he can create and uh, to really trigger a little more rotation. Um, and so we always work on kind of looking at, we, I, we keep an eye on where the handle of the club is at the top in relation to his shoulder, his turn shoulder plane. So where his turn, where, where the plane is through his right shoulder, and you'll see it's slightly above, and that's kind of his sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, the and, left arm, just slightly above the right shoulder. Correct. And, yeah. you know, little things that I keep track of, you can look at how yeah. nice his right forearm matches up with his spine. I mean, Henrik is, is an artist with the golf club. He's He swings it so well. We really don't do much with the golf club because he just – um is basically he can take five weeks off he'll walk in the studio and he'll swing three times and he go well still on plane you know yeah. so yeah. but that's not all of it right you can swing it on plane and, and not be doing some other things very other things very well so um yeah it's, it's you, usually all body stuff with with henrik when you when you say get a little more loaded what do you what do you mean by that yeah so with that working towards keeping the left knee stable in the backswing and not letting it travel inside the uh, the left hip, it can sometimes stay, the weight can stay a little too far to the left. So you get a little reverse pivot kind of thing going on that you don't really get loaded into the right side. So, mm -hmm. um, making sure that the, uh, the chest one is staying on top of the hips and that the hips are staying more to the right, uh, not letting the hips get left in the takeaway. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that's where the knee shoots. If the knee, if the hips get left in the takeaway the knee shoots in, and then there's nothing to stop the hips from flying out in front. And like I say, that ends up turning into a, a tilt through the ball yeah. uh, instead of a turn through the ball. So, uh, and he is a guy who likes to cover and stay on top and hit cuts. So that doesn't work very well. Right. Yeah. You can get two on top, right? Like you can, you get on top of it and then you turn and you kind of hang left with the weight. And then when you go to fire, it's just so steep and probably that left arm gets a little too upright. You know, it's funny you say that I, I was really shocked last week watching um, Lowry on Sunday. It, this is, it's exactly what I felt like he was doing. You know, he's a cover, and he mm -hmm. just looked like he was so on top of it. There's just things got a little short and cut off going back, and then he's hitting all these hard pulls and club mm -hmm. looked steep into the ground and a little surprised by that. Um, and that's something you got to be careful with when you're, I would imagine, when you're playing with a 
with someone like Henrik, who, like you said, he likes to cover it, um, which is a good thing. But yeah, sure. But when you start getting spinny and, and the pelvis starts running left and then they and then they really run out and then then they have to back up. And there's not many players that like backing up to the right if you're playing for a paycheck. <laughs> Correct. Yeah, there's there's not a lot of that that helps. Um for sure. So when you you know, I look at this here and then I think about Josh Greger, who you mentioned with the short game and you know, like I this is a kind of club face position that's very neutral that would be pretty conducive through the bag and like using the bounce a little bit as well, right? Because we, we see some players who who get that really flex lead wrist and that can have some issues in the short game um, with the leading edge. But when you look at Hendrick, pretty pretty neutral club face um, and probably has no issue as far as, you know, leading, leading the shaft forward in the full swing, but also then letting the club head pass around the greens with Josh. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he's... Uh... Henrik is, uh, was a tennis player and a golfer growing up and he, he was really, really good at tennis and, mm. uh, had to, had to make a decision at one point. So, uh, he chose golf and I think he chose, well, uh, we don't know. He could have, you know, who knows what he could have done in tennis, but, but I think because of his tennis background, he is really good at releasing the club, um, mm. and gets that at a, at a little different, uh, cause he's, he's generally not going to be somebody that's, you know, the shaft pointing outside of the left arm, uh, at impact. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty lined up. He's going to let it go. He's going to use his body to kind of control the, uh, the loft on the club at impact. Mm -hmm. So if he wants to hit a little lower, he's going to go ahead and let himself get out in front of it because he's going to release it. Um, mm. he's not really a holder. So, um, the, uh, uh, he is, you know, like for me, if I was going to try to hit a ball real high, which is one of the things that makes like Henrik is, is very interesting is if he wants to hit one really high, he's going to cover it and hit down on it more to spin it more where if I wanted to hit one high, I'm going to hang back and try to hit up on it. Right. So it's like, I, if I hit down on it more, it's going to be a seed coming out, you know, at, <laughs> with no launch. Right. So it's interesting that, uh, you know, I could never even imagine doing that just cause it's a different release pattern. So yeah, that that's a really good point. Um, and, and all of that is, Oh, let me see if I can get that back. Hold on a second. Here. All of that is around how he releases the club and doesn't have, let's say, a great deal of shaft lean, right? Where I mean, he's got he's got a lot. Of, you know, he's got a good good angles coming out of the top and to sure. to waist high, of course. Sure, but he's releasing it more. He didn't have the lean of the handle, say, like a like a DJ, right? And so, as a result, he can cover it and still hit it high. Where that'd be difficult with that amount of shaft lean. Um, you'd have to, you'd have to have a little more side bend and, and get behind it. So that's, that's a really, uh, interesting point. There's a lot of people that would pay money to have that position right there. He's coming to us live from Tulsa, Southern Hills, PGA championship this week, Chris Mason. Can you share with my audience, maybe one or two things that are, we're like, okay, we've got to get back to a and B on this blueprint for cage. What was that? So he's not the most flexible or mobile guy. We've been up to TPI and had him assessed. Um, you know, he's not, he doesn't love working out. So, you know, there's certain limitations within this body that are, that don't allow him to swing the perfect way that he wants to swing. You know, the, the Koreans grow up on the driving range. They think it's a, you know, a position system and that everybody has to swing it like Tiger Woods. And if it's not perfect all the time, then they, you know, they're looking for something different. Now, with KH, he has a tendency to not rotate his body on the backswing. He gets narrow with his arms and his hands and arms go up and the club gets laid off, which shoots the club and gets it a little bit steep in transition. And then he has to end up getting the high handle and flipping it. So basically everything I've done from day one is to try and get him a little bit more depth with his body turn, a little bit flatter and wider with his arms. So that kind of adds the shallowness on the backswing so that he can... Um, but he just, so he doesn't have to shallow it with a side bend on the downswing. So um, this this video, actually, I think he posted, it was um, basically the weekend after the Masters, I went down to see him in Orlando. Um, his arms were much higher than that, uh, more disconnected. He didn't have enough hip rotation. Um, the club gets very laid off, so we get steep in transition. So we're just trying to add a little bit of depth on the backswing then. So with that that space between the knees in there, you know, where he's turning that right hip a little bit deeper, 
you like to see that little window open up and then of course that left arm just gets a little bit more around him is that is that correct yeah i mean even ideally on this one like i would get him even flatter flatter than this swing here okay much better than where he was this was literally i don't know two hours into our work so mm -hmm. um he obviously liked it because he posted it but um club gets a little bit more online the face gets a bit yeah. more full and then it naturally shallows better on the downswing as a result top short game coach josh gregory take my audience through what will's doing here on this type of shot so if we look at this th this would be more my my jason day model i think jason day is probably the best basic chipper in the world uh ba basic chippers pretty much if you if you look at his setup we're always trying to get his sternum if we draw a straight line down the center of his hat down his chest it should go to the golf ball if you notice that his buttons stay on the ball or ahead of the ball the whole time so all we're trying to do is to get a very centered kind of left position with very kind of stiff wristed uh, wide in the backswing so if you look at it when it's parallel to the ground that club look how much look how far his hands are away from the ground at, at that moment club's pretty much parallel to the ground there's very little hinge and from there he's just hitting it hitting it with his center with his core with his chest so our goal is that it's way more of on a U kind of arc, not a very V arc, which would be straight up a V shape, which is straight up and down, which would require more for, for more height. So this is just trying to control his low point by using his center, using his core, using his pivot. You know, I've said this num numerous times in chipping this way, your hands are just along for the ride. You're hitting it with your core. You're hitting it with your chest. And the hands, yes, we know you hit the golf ball with the hands. I've had people comment that to me numerous <laughs> times. Well, well, you're hitting it with your hands. Well, no shit. Excuse my language, but I mean, I, I know you're hitting it with yeah. your hands. But the, <clears throat> the feel is that the body is controlling the pivot and that the hands are just along for the ride and the ball just gets in the way. And if you notice this, we're taking very, very little divots. If anything, right. I want it to be picked. Will, when he first came to me, was amazing at the hard shots extremely good at the flop shot but was pretty poor basic stuff so we just cleaned this up to get it to, he had a super he had a lot of shaft lean a lot of wrist cock in the back swing a lot of stab um a lot of divot so he was great at spinning it and hard shots but not very good at the basic okay now i'm gonna pull up another one <clears throat> here's another one you sent me so this one in your text this you said this is a cut release correct okay so let's play correct. this Walk my audience. What's different here? So in everything Will does, he tries to keep the club out, outside his hands at all times, in his full in his full swing, and his chipping or whatever. But if if you notice, this would be this would be more of a technique that I would want to see guys use off very tight lies. So when the lie okay. is very very tight, now different from soft. You know you know when you can get the tight but yet soft underneath. This would be very firm, something you would get maybe in Phoenix or Vegas or somewhere where when it's firm, we want the weight more left. We want the path to be a little bit more out to in on the cut side. So you can see his club stays outside his hands. And if you look post impact, his hands kind of disappear in, into his, into his stomach. If you can, if you, if you notice post impact, the hands work right a little bit mm -hmm. more left club exits a little bit more left. The face is more open in relation to the arc and it's going to have just a little cut spin to it. But what that does is that moves his low point just a little bit more forward because the lie is so tight, we've got to get on the ball first. Uh, one of the top coaches in the game joins me from England, Pete Cowan. Pete, when I look at Henrik Swing, the first thing that jumps out to me, and, I, and I've always wanted to ask this to you, is his belt buckle or his pelvis moves laterally towards his right heel before he takes the club back. And sometimes... It's more pronounced than others. Can you educate my audience on what's happening there? Yeah, it sits, it sits back uh, quite a little bit. But uh, what you've got to remember is there's three balance points in the swing, basically. There's more, but the basic three balance points. There is the upper vertebrae, which is the top of the neck. There's the tailbone, which is at the bottom of the spine. And then he's basically your feet. So you've got those three balance points. And... Obviously, the tailbone is massive in the golf swing in that it, if you think about it logically, if you stood up vertically and just twisted what I call the spiral body, the tailbone as you twist goes left as you turn the, on the backswing. And then obviously, as you're coming down, the tailbone goes back to center. 
and then the tailbone goes to the right, if you like, as mm. he's swinging through. So your tailbone's always in opposition to the movement you're creating, the mid balance point. So if you, mm -hmm. the best way of describing it is if you stand up vertically and just coil your body as a vertical and see where your tailbone goes or the bottom of your spine, it always goes, as you're turning to the right, it goes left. As you're turning back to center, it goes to center. And as you're turning left, the tailbone goes. So looking at where the tailbone goes and Henrik sitting in there, he's actually creating a balance point where he can work around his tailbone a lot better to create room for his arms to come under. And he doesn't thrust, he doesn't really thrust his tailbone forward mm -hmm. in the downswing, which means you're going to get trapped. Yeah, and, and I've, I've heard you talk about the spiral staircase a lot. And I think it's one of the best videos that I've watched um, that's out there. In the spiral well, staircase. The spiral is very, very simple. Everything in the world grows spiral. You know, mm -hmm. even your ligaments and your muscle structure. The baby in the womb grows spiral. The tree grows spiral. The grass grows spiral. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a real natural thing to do. And if you stand and realize that the spiral is the most efficient way of creating power and to avoid injury, then I think more people would, you know, achieve it. And there is such a, a program as called the Spiral Dynamics, mm. which if you look at it on uh, on YouTube, I think you'll realize it's, a, I think it's Austrian guy or German guy. And he was, he's talking about the natural movement of the spiral and mm. how you actually would work that spiral. And that's part of it. And of course you've got the spiral from the ground upwards and everybody talks about ground force reaction but when you look at the spiral it creates the proper ground force reaction mm -hmm. and what i mean by that if you simplify it to the extreme when we're doing it if we simplified it we would create a big spring in our hand this is a too much of a simplification travis but let's say we've got a big spring in our hand and i hold the bottom and twist the top right i'm creating coil all the way through that spring Mm -hmm. and the center's not moving yeah yep and then just before you finish coiling the top what you do is compress the top down so you compress the coils which then forces the ground force reaction of the lower part of the coils which twists it the other way and then they align and then they open up together so you never get this problem where your tailbone's going forward and in the way of your arm swing coming through and I think you made a good point there in that that little movement of of Henrik where that, let's say the tailbone, as you mentioned, that balance point kind of shifts a little bit over to the right and then he turns and he's kind of on top of it. Then then he it's easy for him to kind of sit and turn and kind of match things up versus let's say, Pete, if I took it back in my lower center, kind of spun away, almost was hanging left, then yeah. it would be it'd be harder for a player to get out of the way wouldn't it oh absolutely i mean you in, in an ideal world you're at the start of the downswing you're you would have compressional change in the head position which mm. would actually force the tailbone to go backwards down the spine and out the way almost that's what ground force reaction is really you want to create that room and if you look back at tiger's swing in 2000 and there's mm -hmm. some great video of him Everybody used to say, well, Tiger's losing height, but it was compressional height. He was compressing his spine back into his tailbone, so he was losing height, but he was creating more room for his arms to come under his chest. And it's very, very apparent if you go back to the year 2000 when I think he was at his best, mm -hmm. Tiger. One of the things that you mentioned with Stenson that I've heard in the past is like he really smashes the ball. It's almost like he's there's this downward you know, smash through the strike. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's different noise when he hits the ball at his best. There's Henry. Yeah. There's a few players that do that. Brooks you is like, one as well. Do you like the term sustaining the down, like the club heads down long through the strike? Um, yeah, I think, and, and again, if you look at, if you look at when I talk about the goal swing, I talk about it trying to create simplicity for the, the golfer to realize what we're talking about here. You know, if we go too much in, in depth in muscle structure and everything, what I always say to players is, right, think of the think of the golf swing as a car. 
right? Mm -hmm. well, if you want to win every race, what do you want your engine to be? You want it to be the most efficient, never break down, and have the most power, don't you? <laughs> right. That's what you want your engine to be, yeah? Mm -hmm. So yep. we want the best engine. We want the best steering so you know exactly where it's going to go. And we want the best fuel and the driver. But let's assume that we had all those four things. Why does we not win? Why do we not win the race? Purely and simply because the transmission doesn't transfer the energy to the steering well enough in that engine. So it's the transmission that is not actually working properly. So mm -hmm. unless I sort the transmission out, it doesn't matter how good the engine is. It doesn't matter how good the steering is or how good the driver of the fuel. If I don't sort the transmission out, then of the transmission out then I can't win the races. Once I've sorted the transmission out, fine, I'm going to probably win every race. But I need yeah. to sort that. So then the golf swing becomes, right, what, what do you want your body to do in the golf swing? Never miss a beat and create as much power as you can and do the right. same thing time and time and time again. Yeah? yeah. So your yeah. body's the engine. Yeah. Your, arm, your arm hand and club movement are the steering. Mm -hmm. And they should know where you've got to go to hit whatever shot. And your brain's the fuel and the driver. Mm. so all of a sudden i've got all those and they're all great but i'm hitting the ball all over the place why because the linkage or the transmission from the engine to the steering is no good so what is the transmission what is the linkage mm -hmm. and ledbetter almost did it years ago when he got the towel drill under his arms and tied his arm swing up to his body with with faldo but no power yeah but very straight right yeah yeah so what, what we're now doing, what we're seeing is that we're seeing that great body action. We're seeing where we know where the arm hand club movement, but what transfers the energy to the actual steering and what transfers that all that power? Well, in putting the towel drill under your arm, you're actually stopping, you're stopping the transmission of the power going to the steering. Mm -hmm. you're, just, you're just locking it in. So what is, what I always ask, what is the transmission in the golf swing? What is the linkage? What transfers the energy from the body to the arm, hand, and club movement? The shoulder movement. The shoulder. Yeah. The chest so shoulder right here. Yeah. The shoulder. Well, the, the actual rotator cuff, the mm. lats, and mm. you know the, the triceps. You know, if you get your lead shoulder and your lead arm loading correctly and unloading correctly, both shoulders, then all of a sudden you're going to add power. You don't get a boxer that box without loading his shoulders. <laughs> He loads his shoulders to deliver the blow from the body movement. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you've got to load your shoulders rel relative to the shot you want to play. So when I ask players, do you, can you load your shoulders for a fade for me? Can you load your shoulders for a draw for me? Because it's what's going to transfer the energy from the, from the actual engine to the steering. So I want to know that the transmission is transferring the energy correctly to the proper steering movement. Hmm. So... Do we, do we all know how to actually load the shoulders for a fade or load the shoulders for a draw? Well, well let's hey, show it. Can you, is there, can you show me that, that load it for a fade versus a draw? Yeah. Well, if you go back, if you go back and sit your shoulders down, sit your yeah. shoulders down and move my shoulders under my chest, then I'm forcing my arms in and the club out. So I get the actual draw motion without chasing the line. Now, if I get my shoulders up and move my arms down, so I'm creating a slightly out to end path with loaded shoulders one way or the other that I can match to the body movement. Mm -hmm. But I'm now loading the shoulders. I'm not relying on the shoulders being locked in. Interesting. <clears throat> That's the simplistic view of it. So yeah. if your lead shoulder, if your lead shoulder is doing the right thing, Lead shoulder, left arm for the right-handed player, right-handed for the left-handed player. Load your shoulder and, and release that w one way or the other, your shoulder muscle structure, then all of a sudden your path matches what you intend to do. Mm -hmm. all right, so well, there's only one common denominator I've seen between all great players when they play well. All great players have one common denominator, and I've not seen any more than one common denominator between them all, and that is – that they all get it in the correct delivery position relative to the shot they're actually trying to play. Yeah. It impacts too late, far too late. Right. They're in the correct delivery. So when they're playing at their best, 
the best players get the club in the correct delivery relative to the shot they're trying to play. Draw, mm -hmm. draw delivery, fade delivery, straight delivery, low shot, high shot, whatever. Yeah. So they're actually in position way before impact. Hmm. We've got a special one that we've been working on for a while here on the uh, evolution of Max Homa's game. And, of course, I've been talking about it on the podcast for the last couple of years and just how really all parts of his game is getting better. I mean, he's longer off the tee. He's more accurate with his irons. His short game is improved. His putting has improved. And uh, all of that it has a lot to do with the work that he's been doing with the guy joining me back on the podcast. I appreciate the time because I know he's one of the busiest in the business, Mark Blackburn. This is 2020 yeah. uh, at the U.S. <laughs> Open right after he missed the cut. He had that's one win up to this. Yep. That is uh, that's day one. So Day one. Okay. Uh, pretty. I just thought you asked for some swings and I'm like, yeah. well, let's go day one. And then we've got some that are from, I guess, this year at the Tour Championship. And then there's a couple um, just post-President's Cup. So the, the first thing is, you know, some people – kind of uh, I guess skeptical of this but the first thing I did with Max is I said well Max I'll meet you in the gym at the Westchester Marriott downstairs after I finished working out Commissioner Monaghan was riding his peloton and Max was met me down there and uh, I took him through a you know physical assessment so the, the reason I think with a lot of the players I've worked with I've had success is I build everything around what they're bringing to me their body is essentially the ingredients to the recipe and I'm looking at, okay, well, what do they do? How do they move? What's going to work best for them in terms of their preference on ball flight, trajectory, height, et cetera, curve. And so with Max, we, we kind of looked at his body and I can tell, have a good idea what's going to be favorable for a player and what's going to be challenging. And so you, you can see here on this video, Max really struggled with flighting a distance wedge. Okay, so one of the things I think that's really important to understand is that controlling your loft on the golf club, your dynamic loft at impact is, you know, what allows you to flight the ball down. And so Max's golf swing, he was kind of, if you, if you get that down the line view again, he was very much trying to work on getting his arms up. You can see how vertical the arms kind of get and the shaft pitch is really steep. And then he kind of drop it under. And then he'd obviously extend into the ball. So those, if you like, ingredients, there's a great benefit to having high hands, big arc, just like a Justin Thomas. If your body facilitates that. Well, in Max's case, he has a really hard time getting his arms above his head, shoulder flexion, maintaining his golf posture. And so his mechanism when he to can I get the club planing from there is he starts to move his pelvis into the ball, the sort of early extension, as everyone talks about. So in an effort to kind of remedy that, I was like, well, Max, I think that you need to probably address what you're doing with the planing mechanisms of the golf club, right? So when you plane the club, you've got your wrists and your hands, you've got your shoulders, and then you some people use their lower body. Well, in a perfect world, you'd kind of want to be able to use your upper body and then your lower body kind of moves and sequences and starts to down. Well, that's not possible for everybody, especially when you move outside your, what I would call range of motion. So for Max, I was like, listen, it's really evident that if you were to get your lead arm lower and flatten your arm plane, I have a pretty strong feeling you would be able to fire your pelvis, control your lower body. The shaft would shallow more without you having to feel like you push your pelvis into the ball and extend to drop the mass of the club behind you, the release pattern would be very different because if you look at the face on here, there's a lot of handle twist. He can't control the dynamic loft and he couldn't launch the ball low. So he had a really hard time flighting the ball. And you can see how, mm -hmm. how much crossover there is in the wrist there. Now mm -hmm. for certain shots, when you play golf, there's some advantages to that. But when you're trying to hit flighted distance wedges and you want to hit really precision irons and great distance control, trajectory control, that's probably not ideal. And one of the things I think most people forget is on the PGA Tour and at major championships, hole locations are such that you need to be able to control your distance within a yard or two. And you need to be able to obviously have the right descent angle into the ball, into the green, excuse me. All those things are really important your club delivery is going to control that. And so the best players 
tend to maintain their delivery very consistently through the bag, right? They, for their preferred shot, whether it's a draw or whether a fade. And so for Max, it was like, look, your body is, you're trying to do something that your body doesn't want to do. So first off, that's probably not going to be good. And when you add stress to that, the lights and the music are up in a tournament, you're going to get exposed. And so it also led to him being very inconsistent with the driver. So he mm -hmm. didn't drive the ball particularly well. And obviously now he's a pretty amazing driver of the golf ball. So I think what we've kind of tried to do essentially is, is cliff notes, build a golf swing that matches his body, right? His physicality, kind of big word for matching your body to, to what you can, your skull swing to what your body can do. So I would say that any type of assessment golfers can get and probably the worse golfer you are and the, the more out of shape you are, the more advantageous it would be for you to probably get some type of physical assessment just to have an idea of what you can do. Because most people think, oh, I need to swing like this and I need to do this. Not necessarily. Like if in a perfect world, you probably wouldn't necessarily have everybody's arms slightly flatter because it, it might reduce their distance. But in Max's case, he's really long and lean. He's got long levers. He still has plenty of height. He's got plenty of speed. He can get it in the 180s. Um, ball speed, no problem. And he's got lots of precision. But it's not to say it works for everybody. Right. Golfer a coach who's got a similar physical sort of, if you like, makeup would be Charlie Hoffman. Again, great mm -hmm. ball striker, tends to have a flatter arm plane. That's based around his, you know, body swing connection. That's not a preference like Charlie did that before I ever worked with him, but he figured out that that's, you know, what, what you probably need to do. So I encourage everybody to get like some type of assessment. And if you build your body, your golf swing around what your body can do, you're going to have better outcomes. So you get all these buzzwords about matchups. I've been teaching like this basically since about 2000 and mm, probably more or less 2006 so with Heath Sloak and Robert Carlson. So I've been doing it a long time. And uh, I've got one of the best coaches joining me over uh, across the pond right now. He's about ready to go to bed and I've got him in his studio. And I'm sure this is everything he wants to do right before he goes to bed is talk more putting because that's what he does 24 hours a day with some of the best players in the world. Phil Kenyon, we've been trying to do this for a while. I appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for being here. Yep. Let's, talk, let's, talk, let's talk your preference for a second. Let's speak to the amateur golfer. Like you said, the guy off yeah. the street, like the right form gets high, right? Um, you know, if I've got, if I'm doing a clinic and I've got 10 people, I would say probably six to seven of them, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to, I'm going to tell them to grip that right hand, a touch more down to the side, soften that right arm, you know, versus being so dominant this way. The other thing I see, Phil, with it is, it, it, and it feels like, you know, a lot of players, because they're trying to get their eyes over it, right? So if I was to come up here, they're trying to get their eyes over it. So they'll kind of get in snug. You know, they'll get in pretty snug, eyes over. And then, of course, their weight just kind of falls back. Very seldom do I see them, you know, so far away that they're top heavy, you know, yeah. out over their toes trying to get their eyes over it. So I, I see a lot of them like kind of in snug, you know, yeah. which kind of leads them to some of this too versus yeah. – do you like kind of balancing that for the amateur player? Like, hey, let's get a, let's get an adequate distance where we have enough hip hinge and we've got a little room to operate. Like, how do you how how do you go about that? Say with the amateur. Well, I think you know, like posture is important there. I mean, you're talking about the trail arm position and and the grip, and it's so easy to think that you know the the forearm gets out of position because of the grip. And a lot of the time, it's really more because of the shoulder position and people's posture. If you way, get yeah. very, yeah, if you get very protracted, it's very easy then for your upper arm to be out and round. And then when you when you grip the club, you're going to get this arm out of position. So, and you know, even now when I sit here, you know, I'm rounded. Right. And yep. We've all got exactly. Good. So I think you know, good good posture, which comes from you know shoulder stability, shoulder positioning. You know, good hip hinge. I see a lot of you know posterior um, tilt of the pelvis, like in you know, like say when you're getting close, then they've got no room. So when you're talking like preferences and, and grabbing the man off the street, you can't beat set you know a good setup, right. and that stems from good posture. And then if you think if you can get into good setup, good posture, 
then you allow athleticism, don't you? You allow yourself room to, to maneuver and coordinate the different segments. But if you set up poorly, um, I think it makes movement more complex and people don't need complexity. They need simplicity. Um, that's going to work, you know, because generally what the average golfer doesn't have a ton of hand-eye coordination, not, you know, when we compare it to, you know, these top players, like you, you mentioned in Max and, and, and Matt. Right. So you need sort of efficiency in, in the setup and motion to help them. The stroke itself, like the engine, this is one of the things you said that's interesting earlier is that obviously there's a lot of different ways when you look at the best players. If you go through the Hall of Fame, you're going to see a lot of different styles. What, Jack Nicholas, one of the best putters of all time. You know, it's interesting. No one, no one is telling anybody to get down in here, you know, like Jack did, yeah. Yeah. Who, who, who just, you know, took that to that alignment, dropped it down crouched down kind of to the side opened up and i don't know almost looked like a bit of a piston action right yeah. um, with the right arm i mean it's fascinating that that's not really taught and when you look at it from the full swing perspective and you look at like the sam sneeds of the world the ben hogan's and these guys you know that had this change of knee flex this long fluid swing we went we went through a period there in the swing where it was like okay no we're not gonna do that we're gonna turn the upper not the lower you know, these were some of the narratives, right? Yeah. Keep the right and the trailed knee flex. But now I think like through this 3D world and research and long drive competitions, those guys had it right. I mean, those guys were free, fluid motion, change of knee flex, move to the right, back to the left. And, and it's just like, don't complicate it. And that's just kind of what they figured out how to do without all this research, without all this technology. So yeah. you look at Jack and this down you know, to the side and some of these other interesting styles like Arnold Palmer, who was way down, crunched down in there. And I know the greens were slower and those kinds of things. Do you ever think about that? Like why, you know, there's, there's no one putting like Jack in today's world. Um, I, I probably not as much as you by the sounds of it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I do. um but the reality is, yeah, we, I don't know if, what, why that? Why that's the case? I mean, what? Why? Why hasn't someone copied Jim Furyk? Um, you know, God, he's probably won as much cash as anyone on the PJ Tour, and and you know, major winner, multiple Ryder Cup winner. But no one sets out to copy his swing, and there are outliers, yeah. um, aren't there? But we never tend to copy outliers. So I think, yeah, I mean, instruction in in some way has. Um, kind of evolved to, I guess, probably stop some of these outliers appearing. You know, I mean, if someone started to coach a young Jack Nicholas, how much would they coach out of him now? That's, a, you know, a question yeah. that you'd have to ask. Um, but, I mean, ultimately, if, if Jack came for a lesson now, you wouldn't change any of it. <laughs> I mean, I think we, I would hope that we start to, you know, as coaches, we understand, you know, the, the difference between idiosyncrasies and faults and we're better at coaching the person not not the method i mean yeah. certainly like 20 years ago when i got into coaching there was definitely like more methods you could see that yeah. and I, I i see that there's a now through the information that we've had you know that the the technology that's available um i think we're better at that as on the whole um but yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I don't don't think about too too much about why. I just try and like look at the players I've got to work with and try and think of ways of getting them better. Um, but they, luckily for me, they didn't come to me putting like Jack Nicholas, so I didn't have to consider whether to try and change, modify, or, or what to do with it. What do you what do you look at as like the engine? If you had to. And I know this can change from person to person, right? Like they're looking at their different styles, but you know, do you look at the putting stroke more as like a little pivot where it's this, you know, your shoulders are kind of moving it in this very subtle fashion. Obviously we're not getting that lower body action going in the stroke, but it's kind of more shoulder spines, you know, this kind of subtle piston action, or is it, 
Is it this, is it more of a kind of an arm, let the arms kind of move the shoulders? How do you, if you had to elevate or pitch it from a, just kind of what you see and, and works with a lot of amateurs to get them moving in the right direction to control the putter head a little bit better, where do, where do you go? Well, I, I think um, you've got, if you if you break sort of putting stroke down into its simplest parts, you've got torso, arms, hands, um, you know, shoulders are a joint, uh, wrist are a joint, and there's movement at, at, you know, at and around the joint. And you're simply coordinating those, those segments. I mean, most people put primarily with their arms. You know, the whole idea that you put with your shoulders, I'm not quite sure what that actually means because your shoulders are a joint. Very often people with that concept are actually just moving the shoulder joint. Um, right. And it's their arms that are kind of, in essence, powering that. Um, so you've got, you know, a, obviously torso is a big segment, you know, and, and that can be a, a huge driver for some people. Um, but I would say most people have a blend of using torso, arms, hands. But it, more importantly, it's how you coordinate those. So if you look at someone like Rory, you know, Rory would be more of a wrist and arms and then torso. So how does how he moves those segments and the, the synchronization of those, how does that affect how the club moves? You know, if you look at someone like Matt Fitzpatrick, he's got a huge amount of rotation in his torso, both sides of the ball, but very symmetrical, very little arm movement. Okay, some some wrist movement in the hand movement. So everyone's different. You know, that I've got a um, student of mine, Chris Wood, um, who, who's been a, a great putter, played Ryder Cup, been number one putter on the European Tour. And if you measure him against Matt Fitzpatrick on a 15-foot putt, Fitz, he would have twice the amount of torso rotation than what, than what Chris would. Chris would use his arms and his wrists, for, not really use his torso. So his arms are kind of gliding past his torso. You know, the append, appendicular system of the arms are kind of gliding more you know, through his torso or past his torso. So every, everyone's a little different. I, I'd say what where the average player struggles is, is there's not a lot of symmetry and synchronization across those segments, which then ultimately, because the club's at the end end of that, it can make it hard to control the, you know, the, the angle of the club face and the speed of the club head. So, yeah. like, symmetry of movement, I think, is important. Definition of beauty is symmetry. So, when I'm looking at a player, I'm always looking at the symmetry of that. If they're using the torso, what's the blend? You know, how much are they using it going back and through? You know, what's that blend of rotation and, and side bend? Um, looking at arm movement, how those arms are moving back and how they're moving through. And then again, wrist movements, how the wrist moves back, how, how that's moving through. And generally, I think issues in club face control or um, like speed control can often come through because of a lack of symmetry in, in that synchronization of those segments. I think of um, Billy Horschel. He's, he's got almost like a little wrist and then it's yeah. kind of torso like Rory. It's almost... I don't know, like a bit of like a little hinge and hold perhaps, right? Like his little wrist play and then he kind of turns and hits it with it with his yeah, I mean, Billy would be pure like wrist and arms. Okay, wrist so and arms. Wrist arms. Not yeah. a lot of torso coming through. No. Okay. Well, like if you think of and, and a lot of characteristics of people's putting actually, you can see through their long game and short game. Like if I have a pound for every time a player said, Oh, I do that in my short game, or my coach has me working on that in the long game. You know, I, I'd, I'd have a studio as good as yours. Um, so you get a lot of similarities. If you think of like Rory in, in his golf swing, he'd have a lot of rotation and, you know, a lot of side bent. So like what, when you see his, his putting stroke, it can have a little bit of a hinge going back, arms travel. And then from here, it's all torso and, and side bend. So his lead arm 
is is actually adducting into his torso. So that gives him kind of that block look that you see. And everyone thinks, so. Oh, you know, he pushes his putts. Where, you know, that's not necessarily the case, but it gives you that like kind of lead arm blocking kind of look because he really turns into that lead arm. Right, right. Yeah. So that, you know, and then you look at Billy, like, and Billy's a, a good putter from, from, from my understanding. You know, he, he's just like wrists and arms, wrists yeah. and arms. But everyone moves differently. Yeah. And, you know, it's just trying to like work out what's your bad put under pressure mm -hmm, right like, do, you pull, do you push do you leave put short long and then how you're moving that club and and the synchronization coordination what causes that pull or push or the, the overhit or the, the the weak put whatever it is and then you're just trying to piece together well if i need to move it like this in order to score the club more easier um you know control my speed easier whatever it is Ricky's kind of wrist arms, right? Fowler, wrist arm. He's not a lot going yeah. on there. Yeah, so he, he'd have some like if you looked isolated the lead wrist, the flexion in in the lead wrist going back, and then you can see that that then flexion is kind of held, and it's a little bit of a late going towards extension. Probably D loss it slightly, and then extension past the ball. So there's a there's less travel in the handle. A lot more um, travel in, in the club head, but yeah, there'd be more, more wrist motion in his stroke. So loads of flow. I mean, if you look at strokes that are fairly like that look rigid or could be described as rigid, very often the torso dominated strokes. Yeah. If I just stood there and moved my torso, <laughs> didn't right. move my arms, it would look like rigid, rigid. Where I, when you start to, you know, have a little bit of torso, a little bit of arm movement, a little bit of wrist movement, it, it kind of adds a little bit of flow and yeah. you know, synchronization. And well, and, I think you said something like it's okay to take like a, okay a little flexion then to some extent, like like the idea that keep your hands solid, don't move them. And I think like you know then then it becomes tight and then the arms get rid and then it becomes that wooden and then we're like up and down and yeah. so. Now, obviously, we're not, you know, we're not coming in and just, you know, like collapsing and and and, and doing that either. But yeah. I think a little like the, the the grip pressure and the softness and the wrists and the arms having that little flow with the shoulders. Yeah, I, I tend to like that. And just for me personally, as you were talking, like I feel like when I am not putting well is when I am I am too tight in my grip pressure and I do feel too torso oriented. And that's when I feel like my head starts to back up a little too much. And yeah. then when I lighten it, I almost I feel more arms and wrists. I know my I know my torso is participating, but I don't feel yeah. like it is. I feel more arms, wrist stroke, and the yeah. suppleness of my wrist. It almost, in some ways, like it almost feels like I'm in less control, but I'm hitting better putts, you yeah. know, because I'm I'm just softer and supple, and not so, you know, my brain's equating this to being. That's what I, that's control. And the reality is it's not because I'm all over the place and I can't hit the center of the face. So, um, so it's interesting in saying that I want to talk about the stroke a second. Um, I always tell the story, Phil, when I was working at golf channel and just, and, and Jordan Spieth was on his run. This was back in yeah. 2017 and he was making everything that he looked at, you know, and it was like, we've never seen it before. I mean, he was just like 18 feet. It's like, okay, it's good. Pick it up. Right. I mean, he's just making everything. And when he won, I can't remember what tournament it was. They asked me to break down his putting stroke and what he does. So I went into his putting stroke. Yeah. And I talked about how his ratio in his putting stroke was a two to one ratio. It was longer back than throw. You know, he, he had a bigger back stroke and then he had a shorter forward stroke. And, and I just said, I just labeled it two to one. So it may not be exactly two to one, but it's a little longer back than it is throw. And I said, when you look at that, and what's unique about it is Jordan has to put some energy in the putter head going back. There's some, there, it's a bit brisk going back. There's some energy in the putter head going back, and then it, it's kind of cruise control, if you will, to the finish. So I did that breakdown. And then in hour two of that show, Phil, Lydia Ko was in the studio, and I had to interview her. And they're like, well, just do putting, because she's a wonderful putter. I was like, great. So I get Lydia in there, and I said, hey, Lydia, 
talk to me about your stroke. Like, what do you what do you like to do with your putting strokes? She goes, well, you know, I take it back kind of short and my follow through is longer. <laughs> You know, so she's like, she goes, I said, wait a minute. I said, you're telling me your, your forward stroke is longer than your backstroke. She's like, yeah. I said, it's like a one to two. I was like, perfect. You know, hour one, Spieth, two to one. Yeah. Hour two, Lydia Ko, one to two, right? Yeah. I mean, those stroke pro profiles are different. Just, just based off of what I just said there, just talk about what that might mean to my audience and perhaps where it may apply if that's not too loaded of a question. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a great question because again, you know, I would have preferences as a coach in terms of how you should try and generate speed. And the reality is you'll find, you'll have players who are outliers who, who control speed really well, doing it very differently. And, and Lydia's obviously, you know, been a great player, and uh, has been a good putter over the years you do you do see a lot of good players i mean lydia's profile would be sort of short to longer typically would generate a lot of acceleration in and around impact right and so the club would be picking up speed very quickly and then if you looked at say jordan's profile which is kind of a longer more loaded backswing that would typically kind of create less acceleration around impact. So um, the speed is going to be maybe closer to being more constant, or you might even have some deceleration. And obviously, like over the years, that's been like a no-no. Oh, you can't decelerate. You've got to accelerate, right. which is a widely perpetuated sort of myth. Now, from my sort of my experience over the years, just like measuring players and seeing what they do, um you get a lot of great putters that actually decelerate um, and i would say i'd see more like good putters with great sort of speed control that have very um you know very minimal acceleration to then deceleration so it'd be not lydia's profile more jordan's profile but the ball only knows speed it doesn't know acceleration so as long as you can, whatever way you do it, yeah. as long as you can match your intended speed, then you can control how far the ball goes. It's just whether you're, you can do that and whether your technique or the way that you're doing, the way that you're doing it is allowing you to be consistent at that. There he is. Short game chef. I like it right there. Everyone to see a Parker McLaughlin. Let's get into like three shots for the amateur. Um, if we had to kind of just whittle it down and say you need you need these three, right? Let, let's start with number one, which I would assume is you got to have one where it's kind of a of, of a little bump and run. So I'll demonstrate, and and you kind of walk me through the mechanics of. Of let's just start with you know a putt chip minimum air maximum roll however you want to look at it take me through some technique of what you like to see in that shot yeah so you've got two options you can go with three different clubs to hit those three different shots or you can use the same club and hit all three shots it's really up to you um but i would say for the amateur player let's go with three different clubs and let's go with a seven iron uh, a 56 degree and then a 60 degree. Cause I think the three different shots are going to be a low one, a mid trajectory, and then a high one. Okay. So w one of the things that I always do at, at my clinics is I'll have people start with even a four iron. And I'll say, this is, this is the, this is the foundation for what we're about to do for our pitch shot motion. If you can understand how to do, how to hit a four iron, then we can move to a seven, then we can move to a pitching wedge, then a, then a sand wedge and then a lob wedge. And so the basis of it is going to start with basically using, using the bigger muscles and, and trying to take a bit of the hands out of it. Uh, so let's, let's say you grab that seven iron and for the, for this particular motion, I want you probably one to two inches closer than what you would normally feel. Pretty upright, uh, pretty upright with the shaft. Uh, I would I would throw that ball position off your off your trail toe. So shaft is going to lean slightly forward. You're going to be slightly closer to it. Um, and then I would say ideally, what I would like to see is is a slight draw path. 
okay. you match that and you match that up with a with a face that's going to be slightly closed at address. This is going to really help that ball roll just a little bit. Yep, exactly like that. In there. And 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 one of the things that I'll even throw in there is is put your putter grip on there. Yeah. However you however you grip your putter, grab it like that. It sort of tricks the brain into saying, okay, this is not this is not a full swing. I'm not going to smash this thing. I got my putter grip on there. I'm going to make a a more of a putting type of a stroke. Yeah, yep. when you go, one of the things I like, Parker, is when you go putting grip, it puts the left wrist in a touch more extension. And with that left wrist like that, that club head wants to get out of the ground a little bit sooner. I right? agree. Versus if I go full swing, let's say I flatten it out and I make the shaft in line, like that, that club head wants to go down longer versus if I go, say, let's go, there we go, this way. And that that extension just it seems like the ball speed comes off like slower and 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 people have a better chance to control it versus it coming out so hot. Agreed. And the same same thing goes with the with the wrist condition, right? If if you're going when you're normal swing and you go further away from it, it wants to work this way versus like I was having you get a little closer to it. Yeah, that that, that, Down. that, yeah. that lead wrist is gonna get a bit more ulnar and, and then all of a sudden now it takes away some of that ball speed because you can't you can't hinge it up and then release yep. it, right? Yep. One of the top teachers is going to be joining me. I'm going to jump in the studio right now. Sean Foley coming at you. Give me your thoughts on shallowing the shaft and, and just some things that when it happens, perhaps why it's happening, what's making it happen, and why it's important. Yeah, it once again, like, I think to call it shallow is to be shallow, right? So it's what, what, why have we seen for generations of players? I mean, you could technically see back in the day when we throw spears, the same thing happening with the spear, right? So it's, 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 it's largely an athletic motion. Um, it, but at the end of the day, it's, getting the center of mass to work behind the hand path. And basically, as we talk about, like as Sasha McKenzie would say, right. Um, you know, when you have a water skier, right. So at that right there, as you just start down, just do what you're doing. Pretty much the boat and the water skier going in a straight line, right. And then what happens is the hands, as, as, as the boat starts to slow down and arc left or right, then the skier is thrown outside the wake at a way greater rate. And there's nothing he can do to not be thrown out the wake. So what we were taught looks stuck, look stuck was actually, yeah, but that's a completely different way, right? Like that anyone's stuck because they've got the center of mass behind it too far there. So anyone who looks like you do right now, don't look like you did when you were rehearsing it, right? They're going to come down. They're going to come down with the mass of the club on top of the hands. So tip it, right? And then because you can't you can't rotate from there now because if you rotate from there, what are you going to do? You're going to slice it. So right. all this all this stuff about early extension. How many people in the Hall of Fame do you think had early extension? I'm going to say like eighty percent. Yeah, I was going to say there's a fair, there's, a, there's a big number. I don't know why the greatest trainers and therapists in the world would have players doing squats and deadlifts and jumping if we didn't intend to flex and extend, right? So it, I, I think the, the, the problem is what we need to realize is that also having proper wrist angles. Uh, now, proper wrist angles is we're talking theoretically right now. You might have three players in one day who have three incredibly different grips. And if you don't, if they won't let you change them, then you have to match those things up slightly differently, right? But say we're going with uh, how many guys on the PGA Tour play with their left wrist super extended? Maybe, what, eight? Um, and now when I say extended, I mean like on video. I don't mean on 3D, right? Yeah. So with it extended. Yeah. Like so now, yeah, or cupped, right? So if you if you take 
someone who's got a really strong left hand grip, right? Moving it way over to the right. Right. Now, my main concern is the club face, right? So if you if you take a super strong grip and then you bow it, I don't really know many people who are athletic enough to handle that. Right? So that, you know, that show the face. Right. Well, we see Cameron Champ and we see right. Dustin Johnson and we see Victor Hovland and we see Cameron Smith and we see Waco Neiman and Mito Pereira. Look, those guys still have a stretch phase. They still have a counter rotation phase and they have an extension phase. So because it and then what we need to understand, I keep hearing people say, you know, this is the way to hit it with the most stable club face. The average rate of closure on tour has got to be close to thirty five hundred degrees in absolute rotation. So even when we start in transition, whether the shaft pitches down or not, the face is so open at that point in the downswing that we have to close it. So this idea that if I get it to the top and then I keep this shoulder in external rotation coming down and keep my elbow bent till it's in front of me, right? I mean, where are you going to hit it? Yeah. Like who, who looks like that? Right. I don't see that. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. And then I know a couple guys who can do it. What are you going to do to hit the ground from there? You better side bend like crazy. All right. Well, the thing is my roommates on tour, are all chiropractors and doctors of Chinese medicine and osteopaths. And look, we're not trying to add side bend in these guys. <laughs> it's like, it's going to happen obviously, but we're not trying to increase it. So this idea that we can hit a ball without using our hands, I think is kind of, is, is, is kind of silly to me. So, you know, even the idea of like lag, right? Coaches talk about playing and lag and great players talk about like rhythm and timing and they talk about releasing it. So how, how is releasing it become such a bad word? Like, I don't understand. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's Ben on has the club face open. He's got a pretty weak grip. Um, it's actually very, very weak. So when we say weak, like let's define what that is. So yeah. if my grip is, is, is called weak, I'm neutral to supinated. And then in most cases, I'm going to be pretty ulnar. Okay. Yep. And then if my right hand is on top, then this is starting to get into pronation. So that, that's, that's what that is. So, you know, when we were kids, no one was allowed to grip it like this. Like everyone said, what, get your V's at your shoulder and you know that, right? Yeah. But those are some of the things that really got me into teaching because every coach I saw said I had to have my V's pointed at my right shoulder. I'm like, why do they have to be pointed at my right shoulder? Well, because that's how you grip it. But, but like, who told us to grip it like that? <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's, I don't see many people whose V's are pointed at their, at their right shoulder. So I think what happens is everyone's arms hang differently from their side. So how people you grab a golf club is going to be slightly different. Danny Willett, his, his hand, his humerus isn't rotated over, but he gets this way a lot. Like he could ride a Harley Davidson. So, the, you know, Danny can play with quite a bit of extension because he just starts so extended with so much radial. So obviously that's extension. This is radial up and down. That's ulnar. And then that's, that's flexion. So flexion, if anything, even though it makes the club face look shut, we know an impact that the club face is pointed where? It's pointed right. Yeah, with the shaft four, it's going to point more right. Of course. Yeah. So even that player who's – Victor Hovland has to – Victor Hovland has to release it in extension so fast, bud. And the thing is we pick it up on video and people go, man, look at that. His club face isn't even – it's just so stable. That's the best way to hit it straight. And it's like, well – Colin Montgomery hit it really straight too. And he probably had as much release as anybody. So yeah. what we have to understand when we're working with someone is that the club face is the CEO. That's the boss all day, right? If I get the club face open, a lot of things that you see after that is just me with my intention of knowing where I want to go. That's just everything you see after that is really just the cause and effect of it's just the subsidiaries are trying to get the face square.
Yeah. And, 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 and vice versa. So I, th I think that hopefully the next technology is something that's going to be able to go in the grip so we can get, you know, we can get really great metrics and data on what's going on in the relationship of the twist and the pulls and the pushes. Um, I think, you know, we have a pretty good idea by um, Sasha McKenzie's, he's definitely correct, but being able to measure it would be, would be helpful. Obviously there's things like hack motion. Those are great. That helps as well. But I would just like to see the amount, you know, when we, we talk about fast hips, slow hips, all these things, Cameron Champ and Wilco Neighbor at Ping have the two fastest hand speeds they've ever measured. Yep. So we understand that, you know, all the energy is created globally from the ground out through muscles contracting, ligaments, bones, all these things together, creating all this club head speed. But, you know, Cameron can get on his knees and hit it like 300 yards in the air off his knees too. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's only going, it's only going 340 when he stands up. So <laughs> PXG has done it again with the launch of a new lineup of drivers, fairways, hybrids, and irons. The new Gen 5 golf clubs deliver significantly increased MOI, faster ball speeds, longer distances, and tighter dispersions, all coupled with the exceptional feel and sound golfers have come to expect from PXG. Schedule your custom fitting or buy online at pxg.com.